NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. Uh, my name is Monica Reed. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Advocacy here at NACDL. Um, and today's program is going to be focusing on the criminalization of voting um, and looking at front-end community engagement. Um, before we get started, I want to turn it over to one of our board members, uh, Ray Delicabata, um, and he's also co-chair of NACDL's uh, Committee on uh, Voting Rights Criminalization. Thank you, Monica, and um, thank you for all that you do for our committee and, and, and on this issue and many others. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is a, a pleasure to be a part of this and, and hear you all speak. I, I'm actually uh, signed up to listen to these speakers. Uh, uh, the Criminalization of Voting Rights Committee that we've put together in NECDL with my co-chair, Seth Chasen, is all about this issue. It's all about recognizing voter suppression and assisting lawyers in defending these cases. Uh, part of the defense of these cases includes restoration of rights as we're seeing in Tennessee. Uh, so all of this uh, blends together and, uh, and it's something we all need to know for people that are interested in this space and being able to help out these returning citizens. So welcome everybody. Thank you panel members for being here. And I look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much, Ray, um, for that welcome. And we'll be sort of sharing information in the chat throughout the program. So you can also be able to learn more about the services and benefits that Ray and the committee are able to provide in terms of providing assistance um, to attorneys who have these cases that our panelists will be talking about um, this afternoon. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison, who's going to sort of kick us off and then further introduce the panel. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Ramon. I'm really excited to be here as well. Uh, as Monica said, I'm with the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, and I am also a career public defender. Um, I was a staff public defender in Massachusetts for many years. I was a staff public defender um, in Connecticut, and now I, I do have um, the occasional representation as an assigned counsel. I still have a contract here in Connecticut because the work really matters to me. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with two people that I do consider friends and colleagues who care a lot about this too. Um, they are both teachers, they are both advocates, and they both come at this work from very different backgrounds and with different kinds of expertise. Um, Aisha Murphy is a professor at UDC. Daryl McGraw is uh, an advocate in Connecticut and founder of Formerly Inc. Um, I will get to tell you a little bit more about both of them in detail when I turn it over to them to share what they have to share. Uh, but to set us up, I'd like to show you a video. The video is actually a small documentary that Frontline PBS did around some of this issue. Um, but in particular, I want to set us in the historical and political context of why these issues matter so much, in particular, to the folks who are caught up in the criminal legal system. Are you worried about whether your vote is going to count? Do you think your vote matters as much as the next person, especially if you're a person of color like me? We talked to some of you about these exact concerns. I think it is harder for some groups in America to vote. It could be because they don't have access, they have to work. Well, not everybody is given like, the day off to go vote. You're not alone. Recently, there's been a lot of debate about how new laws might restrict voting, especially when it comes to younger people of color. And on Capitol Hill, the debate has been raging on both sides. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. We should all be against voter fraud. We should make it as hard to commit fraud as we possibly can. We are witnessing right now a massive and unabashed assault on voting rights, unlike anything we've ever seen since the Jim Crow era. What if I told you that the concerns we're seeing over whose vote counts today are just the latest chapter in a tale as old as America itself? Here's what civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson has to say about it. The first lesson that black people had to navigate in this country was that voting is dangerous. Voting is going to be met with violent resistance, particularly in regions where there are enough black people to actually have impacts on outcomes. 
Throughout that 100-year history, between the end of Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, the inability to vote is what shaped black life. Bear with me as we go back in time a bit, but it's important to know this in order to understand how we got here. We're gonna start with the Reconstruction era right after the Civil War. Following the defeat of the Confederacy, the new government moved to enshrine the rights that Black Americans fought and died for in the war. In 1868, the states adopted the 14th Amendment, granting citizenship and the promise of equal liberties to everyone, quote, born or naturalized in the United States, including people who'd been enslaved. Two years later in 1870, the 15th Amendment made clear that states couldn't prevent people from voting based on the color of their skin, although it only applied to men at the time. Taken together, the two amendments were designed to help cement the rights of black Americans. And for a time, it worked. Throughout the next decade, numerous black leaders were voted into state and local offices. In 1870, Hiram Revels of Mississippi became the first black senator. And four years later, Blanche Bruce, a Mississippian who'd been born into slavery, was also elected to serve his state. But just as black Americans were making these advances, white mobs throughout the South led campaigns of violence to intimidate black voters from going to the polls. And in the end, several of the seats held by black candidates were lost. In addition to the violence, several states implemented poll taxes or literacy tests, and in some cases, even redrew the voting districts in efforts to delay and deny black Americans from voting. The long struggle would continue for nearly a century. Then in 1965, things came to a head with a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. The day would later come to be known as Bloody Sunday. One of the organizers of that day was future Congressman John Lewis. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation, and dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens denied the right to vote. You are ordered to disperse. That march will not continue. The images from Selma sparked national outrage and led Congress to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Part of that law originally targeted seven southern states, requiring them to get federal approval for any voting law changes. A year after it was passed, a quarter of a million black Americans had registered to vote. By 1968, 385 black people had been elected to office across the South, and that number would continue to swell to nearly 4,000 by 1985. But by then, a growing backlash would give rise to new challenges placed on black voters. When you don't want somebody to vote, you create various kinds of things. Now we'd come with the 1965 Voting Rights Act, they couldn't deny it outright, so you find ways to try to suppress it. That man, Henry Hank Sanders, was one of the people voted into office thanks to the Voting Rights Act. But before serving in Congress, he represented two activists, Albert and Evelyn Turner, in a voting fraud case brought by the U.S. Attorney in Alabama at the time, Jeff Sessions. Sessions would later go on to become Alabama senator and during the Trump administration, the U.S. Attorney General. It was my impression that Jeff Sessions thought that those legal cases would stop black folks from not only using absentee vote, but it would stop black folks from uh, voting in the numbers that black people were voting. At every chance he got, he was talking about voter fraud, voter fraud. Sessions denied that the case was racially motivated and has continued to insist that he was only doing his job. I just feel like we tried to conduct ourselves in the, in the right way. I never got in the uh, argument of race or other... And as for the Turners, they were ultimately acquitted of all charges. But the idea that widespread fraud exists in our elections didn't go away. The people of this nation and the people of this world cannot accept a fraudulent election for the President of the United States. Now on the verge of maybe perpetrating one of the greatest frauds in voter history in this country. Voting by mail is wrought with uh, fraud 
and abuse. Here's and author Ari Berman, who's written extensively about voting rights. So this is a very old argument, uh, voter fraud. I mean, there are cases of voter fraud here and there, but it doesn't happen in the numbers necessary to show that there's some sort of great conspiracy out there to steal elections through voter fraud. Voter turnout in the 2020 election was the highest it had been in over a century. And in its wake, some states pushed for more restrictive voting laws. But some experts worry those laws could make it harder for people of color to vote. They point to new restrictions on the number of drop box locations, shortened deadlines to request mail-in ballots, and stricter requirements with voter IDs. But despite all this, many of you told us you're still hopeful. And overall, voter turnout has remained high. I'm honestly hopeful for the future. I think with the rise of social media, um, we're seeing that if you, a candidate can no longer get into a small scandal and wipe it under the rug. Personally, I believe that my vote will matter. You're going to know what to look for. And it's basically how we want our next four years to be. We all do have our different ideas, obviously, and opinions. Everybody has their different opinions. But I have hope. Still have questions about voting rights? We're covering this story at pbs.org slash frontline. So I also love how this video ends because it's just so opt it's like the optimism of young people who are the folks who are the vanguards of so many of these issues and are going to be taking up the mantle of holding our government to its democracy. Um, but also I think it highlights so many of the intersections uh, around voting rights, access to voting, power, privilege, and disenfranchisement. Um, so I'm really excited to invite in this conversation professor uh, at UDC, Aisha Murphy. Um, I met Aisha before she was a professor when she was working at the ACLU doing civil rights and racial justice work. Um, she's a co-founder of the Black Public Defender Association, uh, which is an incredible section of NLADA, but really its own entity entirely. Um, and through BPDA, I had the opportunity to be trained in how do we talk about race issues as they intersect in the criminal legal system? How do we really bring awareness to all this? Um, Aisha gets to work now as a clinical instructor at UDC doing uh, criminal law and race equity work. And Aisha, will you share with us a little bit about how you see this um, intersecting our work and nationally? Sure. Thank you for that introduction, Ali. And thank you for the video that I think really puts this into context. I think the the history and the recent sustained and persistent attacks on voting rights, particularly for people of color, highlight just how important it is for shaping the communities that we live in. And that doesn't change for people who are incarcerated or people who have felony convictions. Folks who have felony convictions and folks who are incarcerated, they should also be weighing in on the laws and the policies that directly impact them and their communities. They should also be able to hold policymakers accountable for their decisions like anyone else policymakers who make decisions about sentencing laws, about how much we're going to spend on prisons and so many other laws. And we also know that many people who are incarcerated and those with prior felonies come from communities that are deeply affected by systemic injustice. When you talk about racial and economic injustice and in housing and education and the criminal system, right? The list goes on. And these folks will inevitably return to their communities, right? And they don't, you know, it's a myth that they leave these communities. They remain a part of them, even if they are incarcerated, right? And they should have a say in the policies that affect the development and sustainability of their communities, right? And then last, I'll say this is important, not only because as people, uh, folks with felony convictions and folks who are incarcerated should have you know, just as much say as, as folks who are not do, but there is research to support that restoring voting rights for folks with felonies, uh, that it increases public safety, right? The Sentencing Project just recently released an import, a report that showed that people with voting rights 
whose voting rights were restored post-incarceration, they had lower recidivism rates than their counterparts in states that continued to restrict voting rights post-incarceration, right? So this is something that is is good for society at large, not just the people that are directly impacted. And despite the importance of voting rights, which is supported by research, almost 6 million people, 6 million Americans are disqualified from voting because of their criminal records, mostly felony convictions, but in some states, misdemeanors can disqualify people from voting. And we all know that a disproportionate amount of these folks are Black, given that almost 40% of people in federal prisons are Black and 30% of folks in federal prisons are Hispanic. So it's Black and Brown people that are really, um, you know, facing the brunt of, of this. Um, there are laws that prevent people from bo- voting, people with convictions and people who are incarcerated. But I want to stress that the misconceptions are just as harmful. Um, You know, as you mentioned, I teach law students and every semester I get a crop of students and we talk about collateral consequences and what it means to advise someone and take a plea and what it means, you know, post sentencing and when they go out back to live their lives. Right. And overwhelmingly, students believe that if you have a felony conviction, you can never vote again. And I don't think that's uncommon for people to believe, right? And these are law students, folks who are closer to the system and to, you know, how policies are made than than the everyday person, right? And there's still that misconception that if you have a felony, it's over and you, you're ineligible to vote. And that's just not true. Um, and I think the first step to ensuring that we as defense attorneys are part of the solution and not the problem, right, is that we have knowledge and that we know um, what what our clients' rights are and that we're able to advise them. And so just to give you a brief overview of, of the laws that, as they relate to people with prior felonies or incarcerated people around the country, there are three places where you never lose the right to vote, no matter what you've been convicted of. And that's D.C., Maine, and Vermont. Um, And it's sad that that's only three places, but still the folks in D.C., Maine and Vermont should know this and their attorneys should know this. Right. There are 23 states where people in prison can't vote. But once you're released from prison, you can and your rights are supposed to be automatically restored. Now, whether that happens, practically speaking, is another thing, but we should at least know that you're, you're you remain eligible when you're released. There are 15 states where people with felony convictions are not eligible eligible to vote while incarcerated. And then for a period of time after, so maybe it's, uh, you know, until the termination of their parole or probation. But after that point, their voting rights are supposed to be automatically restored. And then we get to the, you know, the states where this is this is more absolute. Right. There are 10 states where there's no automatic restoration. So folks who've been convicted of felonies, they have to take some type of action to restore their rights. And some folks will never get their rights back because of certain crimes they've been convicted of, like typically very serious crimes like murder. Um, Virginia, though, is the only state that permanently disenfranchises anyone convicted of any felony. Felony. It's in their constitution. Um, And I think a lot of folks would be surprised to know that, that there's one state that does that. And, you know, that state, you know, if you want to restore your rights, you have to petition the governor, which we all know is probably not a realistic avenue for most people. And so it's really important that we, you know, make ourselves familiar with the laws that are in our own jurisdiction where we're representing people so that we can educate them about their rights. And there's a really great website that I want to share that's maintained by campuslegal.org. And you can literally go to the website and you can give your your client, their families this website or use it yourself and you can select a state. I saw some folks from California. So I'll just randomly pick California. You type in whether you've been convicted of a felony. Type in yes. Are you currently incarcerated? Let's type in yes. Are you currently incarcerated in a county jail? Let's type in yes. 
Are you currently serving a state prison sentence even though you are in a car county jail? Let's say no. And so it tells you based on all of the criteria, you can vote in this instance and here's how you vote. And so I think this is a, a really great tool that allows even defense attorneys who are pressed for time, who have so many things going on to just become more knowledgeable so that they can advise their clients. Um, so that that kind of brings me to to the end. And then I'd love to hear um, what Allie and Daryl have to say, but w what can we actually do as defense attorneys realistically? How do we make sure that you know, our clients know about their rights and that they're able to actually um, take advantage of their rights. Um, we know that the law and practice is different. So even though they legally are eligible to vote while they're incarcerated, for instance, I I've never seen voting information disseminated at, at the DC jail. I've never heard my clients talk about how folks are really trying to get them to get their votes in. I've never, you know, any effort like that is always led by the folks who are inside, not necessarily the administration. And so, um, you know, that's where we come in, right? We make sure our clients are educated. When we talk about holistic representation, this is a part of it. We don't just, you know, limit our representation and our discussion and our preparation to the case. We think about everything that could impact our clients and voting is a huge part of that, making sure that they are integrated into their community when they are incarcerated and when they're, when they get out is a, is a big part of our job. And so we should be making sure that we take it more seriously. Oh, a hundred percent, Aisha. And I think about how I know this feels political because in fact, there are a lot of politics that have gone into making voting really hard, uh, mm -hmm. but the right to vote is not political. So even folks who are operating in state public defender organizations where you can't step into political stuff, you know, telling people how to access the vote, how to register to vote, what their rights are vis-a-vis -vis the vote, that's always in our purview because that's part of our representation and it is in fact a collateral consequence. Um, I definitely wanna welcome people to ask questions in the chat, ask questions of you know any of the information that Aisha shared. I'm happy to cut back to her. Um, there isn't anything in there just yet. And so I'm actually gonna throw this question to our friend who's also on this webinar with us and that's Daryl. Um, Daryl, I, you know, I'm going to read a little bit about what Daryl puts out about himself. So Daryl talks about how on June 10th, 2010, he walked out of a Connecticut prison equipped with nothing more than his GED and six composition notebooks filled with what he called his five-year plan to successful community reentry. Now, I think that's meaningful because I met Daryl five years later. I met Daryl in 2016 at a race equity training, and he had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. He was engaged in criminal justice as a professional, as an advocate, as someone with lived experience. Um, he was working at UConn for the Institute for Municipal and Regional Policy, and he was sharing all of this knowledge in a way that was really, really brave and amazing and incredible. And I'm so excited to have him in this space now. Um, Daryl also runs a nonprofit called Reentry Inc. And it deals, or formerly Inc. And it deals with reentry. Um, and so Daryl, can you tell us, A, what is your experience like with, or the experience of the folks you work with like around voting rights and being talked to about voting rights? Sure. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Saisha. All this information. I'm I'm reading some of the stuff in the chat. I see some movement in New Mexico, and then I I love that we're having community. This is what it's about. So we're setting the table. So if you have some updated information that we haven't shared, please share it in the chat because, as you know, knowledge is power. You know, I um spent ten years of my life cycling in and out of the correctional system in Connecticut on what I call the installment plan. So I went in and I came out, made sure the food was I'd go back in and making sure the food was still gross. It was. And, you know, I just kept cycling in and out of that cycle, like many of the people, um, you know, that you work with. And I think about every time that, you know, I stood before a judge or talked to my lawyer about a deal, whatever the conversation was when I was accepting a plea. 
no one has ever talked about voting or voting rights or anything like that wasn't even a, a conversation. And, you know, we want to hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about collateral consequences, as you know, as we cycle through. And if not, man, please know the collateral consequences that happen. You know, I know as lawyers, many of you that are lawyers, you don't have to talk about them per se, but as a human being, we should be talking about collateral consequences and voting rights. Because like I said, when someone came to me and said, well, this is the offer, this is what, and by you accepting this offer, blah, 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 no one said that you would not have the right to vote or you wouldn't be able to vote. I never, no one talked to me during, during the process of in front of the judge. No one talked to me while incarcerated. There was no literature. And even in transition, which reentry is something that is near and dear to my heart, because as many of us on this call know, when America locks up more people than any other country in the world, yet we and we do that very well. But we have not figured out how to successfully transition people back home. And that's why I sit on these calls and that's why I sit wherever I can to talk about successful reentry and how do we get our lives back on track after incarceration and being a part of part of getting your life back on track is being a part of the community and being part of the community is having a voice in the community and that is voting everything that each and every one of us that are on this call that can hear has that same right um we deserve that as well we want that we want that the opportunity i remember the first time i was able to go and actually cast my vote. It's interesting, I should have mentioned Vermont. I was just in Vermont with a bunch of advocates and, and change makers, and never do we talk about that you can have, you can vote there, whether on paper or not. And that's something we should be shouting from the rooftops. We should be bragging about that because that is impressive because one of the things that, you know, we lose so much when you get incarcerated, you lose so much I and mean, you're stripped of everything. And then when you return home, we know all the challenges it is to try to get a job and find housing. And then that just one more thing. Oh, yeah, by the way, you can't vote either. Um, so having those, um, you know, the important conversations of, you know, for it would have been helpful for my defense attorney or someone to say to me, you know, I know you're accepting this plea. This is what's happening. You're about to take this two years, four years, or whatever the case may be. Also, I want you to know these are the ramifications. These are these, as you accept this plea, these are some of the things that you're going to have to deal with on the other end. We don't never talk about what's going to happen on the other end of the sentence and what's that going to look like. You may not be able to vote. You won't be able to vote. You won't be able to do these. These are the conversations that we should be having, whether it you it's part of your job or just part of you being a human being, helping a person go through a process, pulling the hardest things in their life. You should want to educate them on both sides of what this is going to look like after your sentence is served. I'll stop there. I could keep going, but I'm excited. Well, I, I want you to keep going, yeah. but let me ask you this. So, Daryl, we know baseline that 80 to 90, depending on where you practice, percent of all the cases churning through the criminal courts are represented by some assigned counsel or another. They are people who qualify for public counsel. We know that you know, Connecticut is not unlike other states that 40% of the incarcerated population are black folks. They're like 10% of our statewide population, right? So we know it's largely poor people of color. Um, and these are also the populations that are being disenfranchised historically from the vote. Now, here's my question to you, and it's not rhetorical, even though I feel like it's going to sound that way because everyone kind of knows the answer, but I want you to talk about your personal answer. I've seen you in legislative buildings talking about policy. You are engaged in policy. Why? And and how does that relate to trying to really both remind defenders and our clients why the voting rights restoration matters so much? Well, we also know the powers through information and, and in those legislative office buildings are where we support, where, where we should be. And shout out to any of my um, fellow formerly incarcerated people that are on the call because it's important for us to always be a part of these conversations. Many times, many times, you know, you'll hear the saying where people, um, impacted people are, you know, the people that are closest to the solutions, but always furthest away from the resources. We hear this all the time. And I, I appreciate Ali and Aisha and, 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 you know, all of you inviting me and other impacted people to the table to the conversation because a lot of times decisions are made without us being a part of the conversation when you take that right to vote we are not part of the conversation but decisions are being made discussions are happening policies are being created 
with that will impact me as an impacted person, but I'm not even a part of the conversation. I'm, well, let me under, let me tell you how this will affect so and so moving forward. Let me if I can't get a licensure and I want to be a barber or I want to do this or and 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 by design we've had this conversation. Let's be honest. I mean it's it's a little afternoon where I mean it's like one thirty, so we could have this conversation. It's by design to take power away from people, right? It's by us not having that opportunity to vote, it takes our voices away. So things can happen where sentences can be increased to 85% and you will serve these things and you can't live in public housing because all these policies are made. So you can't go back home to your family because they live in public housing, but that's where I came from. And that's where my family's at. Oh, but they created this policy. But when you created this policy, did you create it with people that were impacted? No. These, these weren't, you know, something simple. We, we, you know, we encourage our people, especially those are even the local elections are so important because those policies where they'll say, well, anyone that lives one mile from the school can walk, right? You might think, oh, well, okay, that makes sense. But it, not if you live in a dangerous neighborhood, not if you live in a community where it's plague, plague could be potentially plagued with violence. You do, would you let your second grader or third grader walk to school in that area where everybody else who is busted, who probably potentially may have one car, if not two, but they still come in on the bus, where those people that are walking to school. So there's so, so many challenges and being a part of these, a lot of times it's been my experience when policies are made, they're normally made by people who are not impacted by the policy. Yeah. So, so here's my question. This is based on a chat. So we have this wonderful note um, Hazel put in the chat from New York about the League of Women Voters report and what's striking, not surprising, but obviously it's great to have this kind of report show it, highlight it, is that regardless of whether the vote exists, it's the actualization of the vote that is the problem. So it's functional voter suppression, even if the laws enacted allow for voting. So I'm, I'm interested in both Aisha and, and Daryl from from our perspectives as both, you know, the lawyer advocate and the client. What role do we have in helping actualize the vote? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll say, you know, I'm not one to say that, you know, in my years of practicing that I've always advised my clients of all the collateral consequences. And did you know that you can actually vote and no. And shame on me. Right. But that's what we have to start doing. It is impossible with Daryl and Allie and I were talking earlier and, you know, Daryl mentioned that there were, I think, over 500 collateral consequences in mm -hmm. Connecticut for somebody who's convicted of a, fel of a felony. No one is asking you to memorize all 500 collateral consequences. Right. That's unreasonable. However, voting is so critical. That's like one of the most important rights that you have, right? And so at the very least, we should be, that should be on our list. We should be talking to our clients about that and the impact that taking a plea has on these rights. Or the fact that, you know, for me, I practice in DC, telling my clients, look, you don't, you're not losing anything, right? So you still, you know, you take advantage of your right to vote. You mobilize. There was a a story a couple years ago about um, this guy in the GC, DC jail who was kind of mobilizing folks to to vote because he's like, we have the right to vote, and we, you know, we're getting involved. And it's our responsibility to educate our clients about this and not just assume that they don't care about it because I think that happens a lot too. We assume that the most important thing to them is the criminal case. And that's most of the time, not the truth, right? Like people have so many other priorities that are, um, you know, impacted by the criminal case, right? And we can't just ignore those. So I think for me, it is um, spreading the information and making sure that I teach up and coming lawyers and defenders this information, right? Educating your community members. And, you know, I, I live in Maryland. Judges are elected in Maryland. Um, most folks don't know what's going on in the criminal courts in Maryland mm -hmm. and who these people are that we're, we're electing, right? Like 
And that knowledge is power, right? Like going in and court watching a judge in Maryland who is not doing what they should be doing for the community and then making that known and voting in order to get that judge off the bat, right? Like those are things that that we can do as individuals and uh, as advocates. Right. I, and I, I agree 100%. Like, you know, in the advocacy space, a lot of times when we're working with advocates, especially that want to do the legislative advocacy, we make sure that they're registered to vote. Because one of the things that when you talk to a politician, they'll be listening to you and they'll be shaking their head and they'll take your name and there'll be somebody standing next to them and they'll write your name down. And the first thing they'll say is, is this person a registered voter? If you're not, Everything that you said means nothing. They're not following up on that because, you know, they are they are moved by voters. So when we are talking to individuals, even when we're when showing them how to advocate in spaces, we're like, listen, the first thing you say is my name is Daryl McGraw. I'm a registered voter and I stand here. So when we are advocating and we're speaking about that, that that, that the fact that you can say that you are a registered voter has power. And a lot of times our people don't understand the power in that, especially in, in knowledge is power, right? So understanding that there's sometimes you can be, at least in Connecticut, if you're not sentenced yet, right? You could be in pretrial status and still vote. That information is not inside. And it is on the onus on all of us as community members to make sure that people have this knowledge. Whether you vote or not, that's on you. That's your personal choice. But I would like to at least have that the knowledge to know that I could, because when we go inside and we say, well, did you know that you weren't sentenced yet? And if you're not on paper, you can actually vote. Oh, well, I didn't know that. No one told me that. Well, how do I do that? How did that proceed? Why isn't that part of the information? Because see, I've been incarcerated, right? I spent some time in there. They give you a big packet of everything. They like to give you the rule book. They like to give you this. They like to tell you what you can't do, but very seldomly do they tell us what you can do. And that's when we come in and we say, don't forget that, you know, until you get sentenced or until you lose your right, you have the right to vote up until that time. And when you do, Get your once you finish all your commitment to the state, the first thing that you should do is go back and get your right to vote, get your voice back, because that's where the power is at. And a lot of times I know I know I'm from impact, I'm from an impacted community. We don't think voting works. So we need to show that the power is in the vote. We need to show them that the power is in the vote. And those of us that work in the legal system who are not sharing this information that voting is key and possible, you're complicit to hiding the ball as well. You are Absolutely. complicit to hiding the ball as well. No, that's, thank you both. And I do want to turn to, we have some questions in the chat that relate directly to this. So first, I do want to say, um, there was a question in the chat about sort of what do you do? Like, what state do you start with? And, and it's a slightly technical question. So I, I'm not going to ask the whole question here. But I do want to make the point that, you know, voter laws are ruled by state law, right? So your your eligibility to vote is governed by your residency and all of the rules that have to do with the state that you live in. It is complicated when you leave a state and have prior potential records in one state and are going into a new state. And now not only do you have to figure out what your eligibility is in that state, but what that state thinks about these other cases. Uh, but the place you always start is going to be the state you live in, right? The state you're going to try to vote in. That's how you have to determine whether you're eligible. Uh, but how? How do we find out? So Jasmine asked, like, what are some of the materials that we can use to help that have been distributed to help educate people about their voting rights in state jails? Well, Daryl's saying, like, he didn't see anything in Connecticut. Aisha is saying she's not seeing anything in D.C. You know, D.C. is a big system. Connecticut statewide is a fairly big system. Um, Aisha, do you have you seen materials that are being actively distributed in places? Are there places that are doing this right that you've seen? I haven't seen materials. I think that, I mean, that's a great step to creating materials, right? Even, you know, on an individual basis, kind of making that a, a part of your representation, having materials that you give to the folks that you're representing, because the word spreads very quickly, uh, you know, and institutional knowledge uh, spreads very quickly. And so, I think we do, you know, have the ability to kind of change um, what's happening at certain institutions by just printing out a list of collateral consequences or whatever, right, to, to distribute to our clients. And 
the website that Daryl mentioned earlier, um, I had never seen that website, but you can literally type in the the jurisdiction and it gives you a list of all the collateral consequences. And, um, you know, we can do the same with voting. Absolutely. I also, uh, that brings us to a question by Joe Hari. I hope I pronounced that right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, but it does bring us, I mean, I, I can, this question resonates with me too. So the question is, is it appropriate to present a voter registration form to someone you're representing in a criminal case, or should we stop at education? Now, I do, you know, I have to take a training every year on what is lobbying and what isn't and where is the line around some of that. I feel like my personal advice, I obviously I don't practice in this specific area of law, of the ethics piece of the law, but I do practice around how do you advise around rights that are political. Um, I think giving them the form is still part of saying here is how, just like I would give them the form if they needed to get their license reinstated, just like I would give them the form if they needed to get their firearms back. Right, whatever forms my client needs as part of restoration to whole, that was a consequence of my representation, I feel like is perfectly within my view. Now, if I say, pick this party, right? Like that is a totally different situation. There it's become political, but the giving the form, making sure they have access to what they need in order to fulfill their rights feels like the space I would take up as a public defender. What do you think? I agree. I don't I don't think there's there's a difference with that and other things that we help like an application for an apartment you know things that we actively give our clients to help them um you know have a chance when they're out yeah no and i, and, I, I, I was just gonna say you know we see a lot um a lot of the tablets and we see all this information you know that is being disseminated through tablets and in the prison systems, they could easily put this information there. It's once again, we have to be find out, is this intentional that this information is not being disseminated? So if, if that's where we need, this is where we need to be intentional that you do have it. What you do with it, like anybody that's on this call now is accountable to find out what it is, right? You can't say, well, I didn't even know that. I didn't even think about that. You're accountable for the knowledge now. Now you know. You can find out and what you choose to do with that information is, you know, I remember and I'll just really quickly say that we had a movement. There was some funding where we were able to get some funding as a nonprofit and go inside and start to get people to register for their vote. Like it was a small budget and, and there were some groups in there and there were some people, not a ton of people were like, oh, you know, because they didn't know that they could or for whatever reason they couldn't. But there were people who was like, I never voted. I never, you know what I mean? And we can be intentional. You know, we were taking vans and picking people up and driving seniors to the to the polls that wanted to vote, but because of physical disabilities, couldn't get to the polls, right? Transportation became a problem. Every hurdle that's put in place, we need to, you know, we I believe in um, being this disruptor. So every time something's put in place, we tear it down. We, we, we'll get you to the poll. We'll get you there. We're going to give you the information. And, and it's your right to do so. So I, I, I believe that, you know, we're all responsible for making sure, especially impacted people, are equipped with all the information to make the, the best choices for themselves. And those of you that work in reentry, this is part of our reentry mission, too. When we talk about helping people get back to a place where they can stand on their own, this is part of that identity that we, we so lack. They don't give you your ID. This also they this is part of your identity that they don't give you too. So not only do you not get a physical ID, you don't even know that you can vote. You're walking around upset about the way things are, and you can be part of the change, but you don't even know that you can do it because no one provided you with the information. Let's go. I love this. What else, folks? I wanna I'm interested in other things that folks oh. are either oh, well, go ahead. I was going to say, Ellen, Ellen makes a really great point about Florida, because I know our friends in Florida fought really hard, but didn't hit a bunch of roadblocks, right? There was a bunch of, they, they fought to get the voting rights in place, and Ellen mentioned it about, like, something about fees, and this is why I love when we come together as a community, you know, fees and stuff may be too expensive for somebody, like, our people don't have the money. And if we do have the money, I'm not paying a fine versus eating, right? But then community service can be useful, like in, in exchange. And it's something that she was pointing out, Ellen, I didn't read, I don't want to read the whole thing, but please check, we resort to the chat where we talk about that. And then shout out to our friends in Florida, because I remember checking in with them and saying that there were still some challenges once they got the voting rights back for impacted people 
where there were still roadblocks being put in place, like everything had to be met, like your fines and all these things. But um, so love to hear more, um, you know, from our friends in Florida. <laughs> yeah, and and hi, I, I, you know, I practice in Florida. I'm a criminal defense lawyer there, so I, I'm not an hey, expert hey. to your to your level there, Daryl or or any of you. But uh, I could tell you that what what has happened here is after they passed the law, a state mandate that was passed over 60% by FRC and Desmond Mead and, and, and that whole uh, crew of wonderful people, they, they came back and interpreted that the sentence wasn't complete unless court costs were paid. Uh, that one, it's been challenged. And it's, it's even gone as far as if there's a restitution order that gets converted to a civil judgment, mm -hmm. that is still perceived as a cost that needs to be paid. So, uh, you know, again, what, what you've all been talking about, roadblocks put in place purposefully uh, to suppress voice uh, in the, the ballot box, right? So uh, there, there's still, there's a lot of litigation. The Florida League of Women Voters has, has, has filed some lawsuits. There's been other laws passed here um, to, to, to go after also the entities that are helping enroll voters, okay? Um, making it more difficult and creating obstacles for them, fines if they don't turn the paperwork around in a certain period of time. So in, in states like Florida, the, the challenges continue to mount. Uh, but what I always try to tell people there, and I've had the pleasure of speaking uh, in a number of different venues, uh, it, it just means they're scared and they're doing everything in their power. And, and we have to be res resilient in our resolve. Uh, you know, NAACP, the canvassers were be being intimidated. So we spoke there. Our, our organization put together uh, what's called what we call Know Your Rights. Uh, and I went and spoke on that. Uh, League of Women Voters adopted it. I believe the Southern Poverty Law Center did as well. Uh, what if law enforcement approaches you? What are your rights to to be able to to deal with that? So, we're trying to help it within our within our abilities to the best that we can. I know my co chair who's here uh, hearing, he actually gets on a plane and goes to Ground Zeroes like Arizona uh, with his daughter. And uh, I mean, so uh, we love what you're doing. We're big supporters, and uh, thank you, thank you for for stepping up the way you do. Yeah, and I do want to point people, Monica put in the chat again, for resources on what NACDL is doing on the criminalization of voting, definitely take a look. There's a lot of work happening. Yeah, we, um, listen, we, we try to focus on the advocacy aspect of it. We stay within our lane. We are attorneys after all. Uh, but restoration merges it, it, with a way of getting cases dismissed in certain jurisdictions like Tennessee. So we try to work in putting people together that know about that. And we're we're trying to train lawyers and find pro bono representation in Florida to help these people uh, defend their cases. That's wonderful. Folks, we're coming up on the hour. And so I really do want to turn it back to both of you to share last thoughts. I know, Daryl, too, if you wanted to share that website, I don't know if it got in the chat about the collateral consequences um, I also could do that while you're talking. I'm happy to drop that in there. Uh, but I would just love to hear both of you um, just sort of final thoughts on all this. Yeah, I think I'll say um, we just have to do better as advocates for people. Uh, our role is limited, right? There's only so much we can do. But uh, I'd like to think as a defender of someone, um, my ultimate goal is to make sure that I help that person um, as much as possible uh, while they're being impacted by the criminal case and to set them up for success once they're finished, right? And that means thinking of things that are outside of the criminal case and voting is one of those really, really important things. It is so easy to get frustrated and to get, you know, um, to lose faith in the political system, especially, you know, in the last several years, but it is, you know, time and time again, we've seen, you know, close races and we've seen the impact 
that, you know, a candidate has had on, on so many people's lives. And I think we have to keep um, kind of forging toward um, going forward in a hopeful way, right? And and that means expanding our practice to, to make sure that we are empowering our clients, empowering the folks that live in the communities with our clients to be a part of the political system. Oh man. Oh man. I love these spaces. I love it. I love it. So I want to say, you know, like similar to what Aisha said, you know, I feel like, you know, when I put my feet on the ground, right. It's to educate, enlighten and empower people. Right. That's our, that's, that's the role. Like that's the gift. How do we educate, enlighten and empower our people? However, our community or our village, however you look at it, that's the role. That's the gift. Like once you, once you realize that this work, has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the other person, right? How do we help our fellow human? Has nothing to do with you. That's when the work really begins. And, you know, I always say that we talk about the pebbles and the boulders. The boulders are the big things. When we return home, we think about pebbles and boulders, right? The boulders are the big things that you can see, right? And you, you can navigate around them. You see them, you see them, and you, you know about those. It's the pebbles that trip us up. It's the things that we didn't think about. And, and even though doing this work, Right. It's easy to try to get the best deal for the client. It's easy to try to help them get uh, housing and help them get these things. But are we thinking about how to help them get their voice back? Like, you know, I want, you know, the gift. It gives me chills just talking about this gives me chills to, to help somebody walk into a place and be have it be the first time that they voted. Think about the first time you voted. Right. And, you know, everybody says, well, I don't know how to help people. I don't know how, to. how about, number one, treating them as human beings and then understanding what we want, the same things that you want. We want to be able to take care of our families and have the same rights that everybody else has. That's what we want. We're not looking for no, nothing extra, you know, just the same things. We want to be in the same, we want the same things that everybody else has a right to access, right? It's talking about access. So I want to thank everybody. Shout out to New York. I see a bunch of stuff that you guys are doing in New York. And I see some stuff like about, you know, it's difficult to get to the people inside. You know, this is where we hit our faith-based groups. We can't do, we're not telling you to do it alone, man. Reach out to impacted people. Those people that are getting behind the wall, make sure that they are equipped with the information to let the people know. There's no way, there's no barrier, there's no wall that we can't overcome. So you just got to figure out a way to get in there. Uh, thank you both so much. You know, it's really important that we are ending on this, this rah-rah about why it's so important and why the narrative of restoration matters. You know, next week, Nachtel's going to start looking at voter prosecutions in Texas. And we know the purpose of these prosecutions. The purpose of these prosecutions is to chill the vote. The purpose is to further disenfranchise people from becoming themselves, from exercising their voice, all the things that Daryl and Aisha are talking about. So hopefully this conversation gave you some, you know, a little antidote to that and has you prepared that as you listen um, to those stories and you think about that, you can imagine what our role is and how we can best advocate for our clients to not be discouraged and to continue to access their right and their personhood. Thank you all so much. Monica, thank you so much. We really appreciated this opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison and the rest of the panel. And I concur in thanking um, them and everyone else for joining uh, for today's discussion. So we did share a lot in the chat, but no worries. If you registered, we'll follow up with all of the information, uh, especially the links and resources um, that have been shared with everyone who registered for today's program. And with that, thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.